now broadcasting to all the attendees. Yes. All right. I see the people are coming in. Thank you all so much for joining us. We are just getting settled. Uh, we'll go ahead and give about a minute or so for everybody to get into the room, but we are excited to get into this mm -hmm. conversation. We only have an hour, so, you know, we, we want to be mindful of everyone's time and try to get in as much as we can. Um, so I won't hold off on, on jumping into the conversation for too long, but want to make sure you guys get in the room. You can see how many people are in there? I can. So right now I'm seeing 21. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you to the first 21 who arrived. <laughs> right. Thank you to the 21 people who were here on time, uh, waiting patiently. I appreciate it. I see some of my friends. Hello. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to Tia's friends. Tia's friends, baby. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to uh, Team Build Bronzeville, who is entering the conversation. Who else do we have? All right, 22, 23. Just slide on in here. I want to have many people from Streets is watching. Bike Club is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, then I'll go ahead, I'll get started with my, my intro and my spiel. Um, the main part that I don't want people to miss is all of your amazing bios, because I really do want them to know uh, that we have some experts in the room tonight. So I will start with my spiel. Welcome officially to By the Block, How to Own Your Future Through Home Ownership, presented by Build Bronzeville. I am your co-moderator tonight, Sandria Washington. I am a longtime Bronzeville resident and also the director of engagement and partnerships for Build Bronzeville. Build Bronzeville, an effort of Urban Juncture, is comprised of five closely linked initiatives that merge social, civic, economic, and creative approaches to community development. So what does that look like? If you shopped or have come to an event at Boxville, if you've spent time in the Bronzeville Community Garden, uh, if you've enjoyed a meal at Freestyle or Conscious Plates, uh, which is what I did about an hour ago, uh, or if you've seen the historic uh, the Forum on 43rd Street, then you have experienced just a little bit of Build Bronzeville's work. Tonight's panel came out of a very simple conversation Tia, which is my co-moderator for tonight, who, who I'll introduce in a minute, uh, is currently looking to buy a home and she has questions. And during our conversation, I realized that I have a lot of those same questions too. And we're sure most of you share some of these questions and concerns as well. But on the flip side of that, this, this panel was also born out of a much larger need as well. Building our communities starts with owning in our communities, and we can't say that enough. COVID-19 and the recent uprisings have amplified the already glaring wealth gap specifically for African Americans. What we know from recent events and our past history is that our families and communities suffer when we are not the owners. There are a number of things that can be a barrier or perceived as a barrier to home ownership, but what we really want to do tonight is show you how possible it is to be a homeowner. Uh, it might even be a little bit easier than you think. And we also want to show you why it's important to own, uh, not only for your, your personal wealth and your personal benefit, but also to benefit your family for future generations and contribute to the growth of your community. So that's why we are here tonight. And we hope that we give you uh, a lot of valuable information to get your home buying or property purchasing process uh, started. So with that said, I'd like to introduce my co-moderator tonight, Tia Lorena. 
had her bio here. <laughs> Tia has lived in Chicago all of her life, with the exception of her time spent living abroad in Ghana and Morocco and going away to school at Illinois State University. Shout out to ISU. Currently, she is a full-time teacher in Chicago Public Schools, and she's seeking to become both a homeowner and a landlord. Uh, we'll get into that during this conversation as well. Within the next five years, she plans to have property in Chicago, some part of the South, and begin her journey of owning in Ghana. I love it, international, which the, the Downing brothers can speak yes. to that as well. I know from their bio. Yes, you can tell. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so with that said, Tia will introduce our first panelist, Crystal Corley. So Crystal Corley, she was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. She received her bachelor's of, inter of international business from Howard University and her master's of urban planning from the University of Illinois at Chicago. After graduating from Howard, Crystal moved back to Chicago and worked in corporate America for two, for two years as a project manager management consultant before beginning her journey career in real estate. Today, Crystal has been a realtor for six years and has sold over 65 units. She purchased her first condo at 23 and her first multi-unit building last year. Crystal strongly encourages Black land ownership within the Black community. Uh, Crystal's goal is to work for and within the Black community to achieve social and economic equity and to close the wealth gap. I love it. Thank you, Crystal. We're excited to have you on the panel. And then rounding out our panel, we have the Downing brothers, Anthony and Anton Downing, uh, who are from my alma mater, U of I, Urbana-Champaign. I-N-I. <laughs> I <-N> I. <laughs> yes. So the Downing brothers, now known for their show Double Down on HGTV, were born and raised on the south side of Chicago to a Bahamian mother and African-American father. I see y'all representing your mom on your shirts today. That's right. On the show, Anthony and Anton battled gentrification by purchasing, renovating, and selling attainable middle-class Chicago housing with a keen eye for architecture and design. After graduating from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, Anthony and Anton both decided to give back to the community by becoming firefighters for Chicago and Dalton, Illinois, where they have served for over a decade. While continuing to build their investment portfolio in Chicago and the Bahamas, they are also working to educate the community on financial literacy and real estate investment through their homecoming with the Downing Brothers podcast, national college tour, community partnerships, and brand co collaborations. Anthony and Anton have started a conversation that didn't previously exist in many black households. It is their mission to shine a light on real estate investment as a feasible opportunity and provide resources to develop generational wealth. Thank you both for being part of this conversation. <laughs> so I think that last statement uh, is, is a perfect place for us to start. And I am curious to hear from each of you, the Downing Brothers and Crystal, who taught you the significance of home ownership and how did you become interested in real estate as a business? Ladies first. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I will start off. So I actually had the opportunity of growing up in real estate. My mom has been a realtor my entire life and she has owned her own brokerage since I was about seven. So in high school, I worked at her offices during the summers on the MLS, filing paperwork. It was kind of just things I did every day when I go home. I watched her, she was a salesperson in real estate. She was, she was a realtor. Um, so even when I left to go to college, my dad had this joke, like, why am I paying for you to go get a degree? Because I knew I was going to become a realtor and you don't need your degree to become a realtor. Right. But I still want to get my degree just in case. Um, <laughs> so that was like a strong influence on me becoming in real estate. She also heavily influenced me on purchasing my first condo. So when I came back from college, um, I was going to rent because I just didn't want to live at home. I was like, okay, I'm I have a corporate job. I'm a rent. And she was like, no, you're going to live at home for six months or whatever until you have enough money for a down payment. You're going to buy a condo. 
So she was the one who was like, no, you're not renting. You're buying a condo if you're going to stay in Chicago. And if you decide to leave, you can just rent it out. But it was a much more comfortable situation and kind of less scary because I grew up in real estate. And then as I got older and more into real estate, I started reading more and read about contract purchasing that used to happen in black communities and kind of just all the disadvantages that we as black people have suffered through systemic racism, especially in the real estate market, which mm. influenced me to go back to school and get my master's in urban planning and to like fully understand how in depth the issue is and realize that until we start owning our own neighborhoods, we cannot stop displacement. That's so real. How yeah. about you Downing Brothers? Well, our, our journey, um, it's interesting. I mean, I look at our family tree uh, both on our father's side and on our mother's side for three generations going back. Um, both mm -hmm. of our, both sides of our family have owned property. So our parents, our grandparents and our great grandparents owned real estate, which was, I guess, I, I guess I feel is unique uh, to the black, black experience. Yeah. Um, Something and, that we want to normalize like through our TV show, through our podcast, all of that. Yeah. And then, um, our mother, she gave us a, a, a different perspective because, you know, she was like, you, she always let us know, you actually already have property, you have land to develop in the Bahamas that she inherited from her father. So it was, she, you know, she put it to us and say, hey, as you make money and as you do things, you have to, you have to own the floors you walk on. It was like a personal challenge. I mean, when right. I got my first paycheck, yes. right out of college, she was like, you're not a real man until you own the floors you walk on. And I was like, the male ego was like, oh. Right. Really? <laughs> Look, that hit my ego and I'm not a man, that hit my ego. And, I, and here I am thinking I did a great thing. I graduated from college, got a job and had my first paycheck, but that wasn't right. enough. You know, uh, but I responded to that though. Cause like, I took that serious. I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna show you. I can show you better than I can tell you. And much uh, like Crystal, um, I live, you know, I lived at home, um, you know, for the first 18 months actually. Um, but I, when I walked out of my mother's house, I had enough money to buy my first condo. So, um, wow. yeah, I, our, our parents are influential. And if you have children, you are influential on in your children, whether you know it or not. Right. That's so fascinating to me because those conversations did not happen in my household. We did not talk about buying homes, owning homes. Uh, my mom was a renter for most of my life. Uh, Tia, I don't know if you have a similar situation, but I just feel like I'm a little bit at a, at a disadvantage by not having had those conversations. Yeah, I definitely think that's why these conversations are so important because you all are, in a way, you have that privilege and you have a unique Black experience, whereas me and Sandria were saying like, we've never heard this, right? And we are trying to like catch up. So where you have had this normalized in your family for three generations, which is amazing, it's like, for me, it's been normalized to like never own. And so I do see when I look at my family tree, a lot of displacement, um, like Crystal said. So I think that kind of seg segue into the next question. What are some business opportunities attached to home ownership? And why is it beneficial to view ownership as a business? I'm sorry about that. Well, yeah, it's interesting because I, I just saw um, I was browsing Instagram and I, and I saw this post uh, that was talking about uh, generational wealth and how simply owning property yourself doesn't create generational wealth. It's the fact that you have systems in place, meaning that you have a legal team, that you have a trust. Um, that you've, you, you, you've taught your children or the next generation what to do with it so that when you pass away, it doesn't just get, um, get lost, you know, so you have to actually teach it. And so, um, you know, property management systems, a team, developing a team that then can be transferred from one generation to the next. And that's how we create generational wealth. I mean, we take these steps to, to build wealth ourselves through our uh, property and our real estate, creating and looking at it as a business. And when you do that, that's building a team around yourself so that you have the property management, the realtor, the attorney, um, general contractors, um, you know, all, all of these things, people to go to, to, uh, to deal with so that you can be properly advised on financing or refinancing so that you can pull money out to continue to develop your, um, you know, renovate your current portfolio or property or house. Um, so all of these things, um, you have to look at it holistically, and that requires you to look at it as a business. Mm -hmm. 
we we actually uh, consult people. Like you go to our website, we, we do these uh, hour long consultations, and then refer you to our whole team, so that whoever's watching this will be able to use the same people that we use as we accumulate our properties. Right. We had this uh, this we had this thing uh, this saying that we say that you uh, you build relationships before you build houses mm -hmm. because it's the relationship um, with your you know your mortgage lender. Uh, with your realtor, um, uh, with other uh, real estate professionals, property management. It's these relationships that, that, uh, that give you opportunities, that give you ideas and open doors for you to be able to do things you're trying to, you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I agree because um, now that I think about it, uh, my grandma, my mom's grandmother, she did own property. But because they didn't approach it as a business, it just sort of like faded out. And so that mindset didn't translate to us and it wasn't pushed down that this is something that's necessary so that we always have a place to go to and we expand on our capital. So it just kind of like they died and so did the property because nobody knew what to do. So I right. agree that's a very vital point to make sure you, you're also instilling that knowledge as well as the desire, I guess. What do you say to the people who might be intimidated by this concept or idea of treating property ownership as a business. So maybe they're thinking, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. They, they hear the word entrepreneurship or they hear business and that kind of turns them off. What do you say in response to that? Well, I feel like when you're, everyone needs a place to live, right? It doesn't matter if you're renting or you're owning. So regardless, you are putting some sort of monthly payment towards something each month. Now, if you're afraid to be a homeowner, if you look at it as a renter, the money that you're giving to your landlord each month is essentially just going out of the window, but you still need that place to live. I don't think looking at home ownership has to be as intimidating as looking at a business because you could do a two to three unit where sure you have landlord, you're a landlord, you have more responsibilities, but you could do a condo or a house where you're still building equity in something so the money that you are paying monthly is almost like you look at it like a savings account unless as a another s something you have to manage now you may have to have your snow guy come out or your yard guy but then in addition you're getting property tax write-offs for your taxes you're getting mortgage mm -hmm. insurance write-offs for your mortgages so there's deductions you're getting where depending on how you file your taxes you may get more money back at the year, right. you may have to pay less money because you have these additional deductions. So I look at it as everyone, like housing is essential. We learned that through this crisis. The real estate market did not stop, especially not right now. But are you going to throw your money away every month or are you gonna invest in yourself every month? Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I will say this to everybody that's watching, you don't have, being a landlord does not mean that you have to personally landlord we have a property manager that manages our portfolio like half the tenants that we have i've never met before you know right. i i would say this to answer your question about the intimidation factor if you approach it as a business this actually becomes easier because now you're def you're deferring um to the real estate professionals to do the work on your behalf so that it becomes automated and easier for you so, I mean, really treating it as a business and having these people doing these things means that your life becomes easier because now you're not coming out in the middle of the night to fix something. Mm -hmm. You're not collecting the rent. You're, you're not, you know, dealing with the catastrophe when it happens. You have a professional that goes out and does these things for you and they just inform you via text, email, or phone call of what's going on. So your life just became easier when you approach it as a business. I like the word easy. <laughs> I like that. And, and honestly, um, before we started buying, um, you know, multi-unit properties, we would, we would, I would hear people, uh, older people, discouraged, say, oh, you shouldn't do that. It's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so, it's, it, you know, it's too difficult. Da, 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 da. Section 8 tenants are going to tear up your property. Yeah, it was all these discouraging things saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Just stick to buying a house. Right. But I, I turned and asked those people. And especially now that I know what I know now, I, I would turn to those same people and ask them, do you have a property manager? Is someone else doing all the things that you found difficult for you on your behalf since you found it difficult? 
because the majority of the horror stories is because they didn't have systems in place to make all these things automated. Mm-hmm. Let's see, I just launched uh, our first poll. Hopefully this works. I don't know if I sent it to the panelists as well, but this one yeah, is see. asking, yeah. what yeah, is see. your biggest home buying concern? Um, I know this isn't the totality of all the options. Uh, so if we don't have your biggest concern, select your second biggest concern <laughs> or your third. Uh, we just want to kind of get a gauge uh, of where people are so we can make sure that we speak to that. Um, it looks like down payment is a big one. A really big one. Right <laughs> now, you're not and, alone. Right. You are not alone. So funds for the down payment and knowing where to start with the home buying process. You know, does it start with just, you know, looking for a house, searching the neighborhood? Like, how do you actually start your home buying process? Mm-hmm. Let's All see. Right. So that's our, our first and second place, third place, you know, f- trying to find a home in your preferred area. Uh, for me, my preferred area has been Bronzeville, and it's been a little daunting to try and find something uh, under half a million. So maybe I'm just not looking in the right places. Mm-hmm. If you find it, let me know. Right. You- <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, want to, I, I definitely want to talk about that. You want, you want to jump in right now? Okay. Into that? Let's jump in. Let's jump into that. I'll leave right. this poll up. Name the name Let's name jump name. into that. All right. So. So I, I, I do hear this a lot. People are really concerned about how high the prices are. Um, and then usually, I, you know, when I hear that, I ask them, um, are you trying to find something that is turnkey? And turnkey means literally that when you turn the key, you don't have to do any renovating. You just walk in because the house is, is completely done. And if you have a particular neighborhood you want to want to get in that you can't afford, right? It's, it's a half a million for the type of property you want. I'm assuming at 500,000 that it's either a high-end single family home, a two flat, three flat, so on and so forth. Um, you, what you can do is that you can do a 203K renovation, mm-hmm. uh, which my very first renovation way back when was in Bronzeville. 45th of Vincent. That's right. I had a gray stone, 3,000 square feet, and um, was able to get it for 200,000 and then did a renovation of the property, which really you know, introduced me to the whole renovation game and said, oh, I can do this. Um, and on top of that, when you do a 203K, you have these built-in, uh, a built-in system to, to, to make sure that you actually complete the project. So you're working with a general contractor. Um, you have uh, a 203K consultant that holds the, the, uh, the contractor accountable for the different draws as you get the money from the bank to be able to, uh, to pay for it. Mm-hmm. The money comes to you, not to the general contractor, so that you can then give it to them once the phases are complete. Um, but to answer the question about, oh, it costs too much to be in the area I want to be in, that, just remember there are alternatives. You don't have to get a fully finished property if you are really adamant that I have to be in Bronzeville, I have to be in whatever neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then also, I'll make this real quick. When it's your primary residence, oh, real quick, huh? <laughs> when, it's your, <laughs> when it's your primary residence, after you live there for two years, um, it, and you got it below market value, you did this renovation, you lived there for two years, you enjoyed yourself, you sell that property, you get to complete, to, uh, to, excuse me, you get to- No capital gains. Yeah, you get to keep all of the profit, no capital gains tax. Mm-hmm. And now you have the capital to now start buying multi-unit, to flip, do simultaneous deals, which is exactly what we did. Okay, all right. Um, and we'll dive into some of these other questions uh, a little bit later. I know we wanna talk about the down payments, that's a big thing. Um, and where to start with the home buying process. What are some common mis- misconceptions about what's needed to become a home or property owner? Common misconceptions that you've heard from people or things that they perceive as barriers to owning a home. So I would say it kind of ties into the poll that you just did because most people usually believe that they need a larger down payment than what they need. Um, Mm -hmm. You're able to get, there's all types of financing. There's FHA, there's VA, there's conventional, there's a 203K like they just described. Um, And you're able to get some of those as low, 
if you're a veteran, you're able to come in as low as 0%. But if you're a FHA, you could do 3.5%. And now they have spot FHA zoning. So if you're not trying to go the building route and you want something with a little less responsibility and you want to do a condo, but the condominium building isn't FHA um, approved, you can do spot zoning for a specific unit to just get that unit as FHA. There's programs that do that. And then there's also down payment programs, especially if you're a first time home buyer, like the Ida grant usually gives $7,500 um, towards it. There are stipulations that come with it in terms of how long you need to live in your place and there's income limits. But um, I would say that down payment and also tying into the home buying process of where it starts. I find that a lot of people want to immediately go out looking for homes, but they haven't talked to a lender yet. And speaking to a lender first, I highly encourage just because you don't want to go out looking for homes for $400,000, but your lender tells you you're only approved for two fifty, dollars and now you have this like idea in your head of what you can get for $400,000, and you can't find something that you loved as much as you found before you knew what you could spend. Or you may be looking too low, and you can actually afford a lot more um, with your income. So I find that jumping right into the shopping process without speaking to a lender is usually a misconception of how the process works and um, the down payment. Really quickly, um, before you guys jump in, there's a question from Benita. She wants to know what is a 203K renovation? You guys talked about that, the 203K. Can you just explain what that is and where they might be able to find more information? Yeah. Uh, that's an FHA loan, the 203K renovation loan. And uh, just like a first time home buyer FHA loan, when it's, you know, three and a half percent down, um, it's just that you get the renovation money and the money to buy the property in the same mortgage. Right. So they escrow together, the purchase and the renovation all put together into one loan. You just have to make sure that the after repair value, so when you're finished with the home, the amount of money that it's required in your renovation is going to appraise out with like comps in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And then if we have, I know we want to include some resources at the end. So if you do have like a specific website or link um, that we can share, I can type it in the comments um, or whatever. So if you do have a resource for that 203K, I can share it with you guys. Benita is giving y'all a thumbs up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for explaining that. Okay, so the next question is. One second. Um, is oh, is this is a big misconception too? Is there a certain credit score that you need to start owning? Um. So typically, it's uh, six hundred and twenty for FHA and then 640 for VA and conventional. But there's also other things that go into financing besides just credit score. They look at your debt ratio and things like that. Um, but that's a very general like bird's eye view of where your credit should be in order. It at least needs to be there typically. There, are, I'm sure there are lenders that would do less, but um, with the lower, your interest rates usually go up also the high, lower your credit score is. But I would, I don't know if the Downing brothers have something to add to that, but I would also encourage you speaking with a lender more to right. know about financing. Right. So I, I want to go back to down payment once thing, because I, I want to share with you all like, okay, in 2014, I bought my first three unit building. Right. And, um, I only came to the closing with $1,200. And the reason why is because my realtor negotiated uh, $5,000 towards closing costs, you know, seller contributions to, towards closing costs. You know, and, and that contribution can be up to 6%, you know, of the, uh, the purchase price. So they went back and forth. They got me $5,000. Th that pretty much, you know, closed... Uh, almost all the gap because I put 1% down as my earnest money, which is like $1,000 or something like that, or $1,200, I forget, or something. Whatever. But all together, <laughs> you know, it's, a lot of people was like, oh, I need fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and stuff like that. And it's good if you can have that money, but a lot of times you can negotiate 
these closing costs away. Yeah. And one thing I want to add, too, is that, you know, people know, um, you know, when they go to get their financing, they'll find that, oh, they need three months or six months of, of payments, right? Reserve payments. They call it, you know, money in reserve. Well, you don't have to actually have the cash because if you have a 401k or some kind of retirement account, whole life insurance policy, deferred comp. deferred comp, if you can show that you have these funds in your retirement account, you can use that towards the three to six months in reserve. And so now you don't have to sweat bullets like, oh, where do I get the cash I need for a reserve in order to get the loan that I want. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Um, and I guess to piggyback on that, are there options or other options for how to lower your down payment or lower your interest rate? Down payment, I would say um, asking to get seller closing cost credit is a really mm -hmm. big one. In addition to some of the grants, interest rates, I would defer to a lender. Right. right. But, but I will say um, for interest rates, the higher your credit score, the better, the better your interest rates. The lower your interest rate, the higher your credit score. So they go in two different directions, right? Yeah. They're polar opposites. And then what she just said, I mean, if you combine getting uh, seller contributions towards the closing costs, but you also happen to, let's say, the, um, the IDA grant, 7500 towards um, the closing costs, you can combine that. You may come to closing with zero. It's possible. Mm -hmm. Or a refund. So refund, okay. Yeah, refund. <laughs> right, refund. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that part. yeah, refund. So, right. and, and this is what I want to encourage people. You don't know until you go to a lender and you go ahead and give them your financials. You give them your tax statements. You give them your bank statements. You right. give them your retirement account. Um, you know, whatever that form that comes in. And the thing is, when I say your retirement accounts, your four hundred one k, your 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 four hundred three b, whatever it is that you have. You don't have to take money out of the account. You just got to show you have it. Just show them that there's money in that account. So I'm not telling you to put the account up and take money out of your retirement. Just show you have it for the reserve part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, can you all speak more about the IDA grants and stuff like that? Because I know for me, I'm looking into them, but I still don't get how it works. Some of them say I need to live in a specific area. So, like, who do I call? Just, like, do I pick up the phone? How does it work? I feel like typically your lender is able to connect you with the source to get the IDA grants. Um, I, to my knowledge, I do not know that IDA grants are specific to neighborhoods. I know it's specific to income. So you, there is an income cap and that you're supposed to live in the place for five years or if you sell it, you owe them a proportion of that 7,500 um, over the five years. But the, if you reach out to your lender, they should be able to connect you with how you would get that IDA grant. But I can do some additional research and look for a link to send you also. Okay, thank you. So I have a quick question. Is it possible you guys can walk us through from end to end kind of like the home buying process? So like we've mentioned realtor, we've mentioned lenders, I'm sure at some point there's an appraiser. Um, when we talk about where do you start the home buying process, can you start us from point A of I have a dream of owning a home to going through the process of now I own the home? Who are the people that we need to have on our team that we're building? And what is the, what is the, the order of the process? Yeah. yeah. Y'all can, you know. okay. Well, it, it starts with a lender getting pre approved and then bring that pre approval to your realtor and then get your attorney almost simultaneously with your realtor. And then from there, you get it's going to get appraised. You're going to have your home uh, inspector inspect the pro whatever property that your realtor finds for you. The attorney is important because once you have it under contract, your attorney is going to then convey whatever you're negotiating with your realtor to, uh, on your behalf for closing costs. So that's why you need to have that um, real estate attorney. So mortgage lender, realtor, real estate attorney, home inspector, mm. appraiser, um, and then you'll go to closing. And then depending on whether you're doing a renovation or not, if you're doing a 203K, then that's when you're also gonna have a 203K uh, consultant 
and then that general contractor who's going to do that work on your behalf. Right. Okay. And don't, you don't, don't be uh, worried about the cost of a, an attorney. The attorney gets paid on the back end at the closing. Okay. You know, so that was going to be my question. I hear yeah. you naming all these people, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> this, is, this is adding up. Realtor gets paid at closing. Attorney okay. gets paid at closing. You know, uh, buying real estate, the seller pays the realtor, not the buyer. Right. So okay. the seller pays the realtor, the attorney, if it's most attorneys I work with charge a flat fee. If it's an attorney charging you hourly, I would. Then they're probably no. not a real estate attorney. No. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> the numbers look like $500. Yeah, so. yeah it's supposed to be a $500 flat fee, yeah. typically. Yeah. <laughs> Which <laughs> normally comes at closing. So you wouldn't have to like, get prepaid and not file it. Right. And I actually have like a, I'm trying to see if I can put it in this chat because I have a diagram that I found on, I don't know if it's going to slide to the chat. I can figure out how to share it later. But I have a diagram that pretty much like walks you through the process of mm. buying a home because the lender is working in parallel, like doing underwriting, you're turning it, all your tax information and stuff to them multiple times. Right. So, you're having your inspector done at the beginning. Um, you're turning in escrow. It, there's a lot that is also happening simultaneously through the process. Um, but if you have the right people on your team, it's usually smooth, very smooth. Mm -hmm. right. If you find that diagram, let me know if we don't find it while we're on the call. Um, I found I just, it. I just don't know how to put it in. It's on a slide I have. I'm trying to see if I can. I can do, do you want me to share the screen really quick? Oh, you can. Let me do, let's see. Give you all access. And we, we actually have a, an illustrated book that's going to be coming out in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, it actually has, they'll have this entire process mm -hmm. on the board. Oh, she, she shared. Oh, okay. Sorry, that was mine. But Crystal, you should have access now because okay. I gave it to all panelists. Yep. Here we go. Okay, there you go. So this was one I found online that I thought was pretty good for a seminar I did before. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So right, we're right here. You meet with your realtor. Although I would say you meet with your lender first, but right. then you go to your lender to get pre-approved. Sometimes I guess they say to me with a realtor because realtors typically have several contacts of each of these things that they can give you to you know, so never yeah. say to go with just one. Like you need at least three people and I think you should call and do your due diligence on your lenders. You should call and do your due diligence on your inspectors. But realtors usually have all those contacts already because we work with them all the time. So then you go to get pre-approved then after being pre-approved is the shopping process, which some people last two weeks, some people last four months. It really depends on the person. Mm -hmm. um, then you write an offer on the home, negotiate the offer with the seller. Sometimes it's a back and forth process. Sometimes it's highest and best. Open escrow, that's important in Texas. And I think this was from a Texas real estate office, but um, you get your home inspection, right? Once your offer is accepted and you negotiate repairs then while that's happening you're also completing your loan process um and this is where the attorney comes in during the negotiating of pairs that's mm -hmm. repairs that's important for them they also put some other stipulations in there like the home has to appraise out or else you have the option of walking away different real estate attorney jargon um you're completing your loan process the home needs to appraise out, so you order the appraisal. This is typically done through the lender, so the lender has an appraiser that they work with as a third party. Or yeah, that's another thing that can be sometimes is you pay, pay get paid at the closing. Sometimes you pay up front. I would say, look, with the home inspection, it's sometimes that's four hundred dollars, sometimes it's eight hundred dollars. That's something you will pay up front. Yes, it is, and yeah. so it's more towards the eight hundred dollar mark when you're buying a building, like a yeah. two to three to four unit building. Right. You're buying yeah. a condo, you can get it as like a two bedroom, two bath. You could get it like for three fifty. Right. The bigger, the larger the home, they need to inspect. The higher the cost goes, but I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I haven't done a house that was more than a thousand, but that would have had to be a really big house. Right. One day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so then you're ordering the appraisal right. 
then this loan package to underwriting, this is all in the lending process, loan approvals during the lending process. So pretty much the shopping part and the part with the house stops after ordering the appraisal. And then it's the lender working in the background to get your loan closed. And then um, you have, you're supposed to get your closing disclosure three days before now after the Great Recession in 08 when it was all that subprime mortgage lending happening to make sure you're aware of all the things you're paying come closing. So they're supposed to give it to you three business days ahead of closing. And then you do your final walkthrough. So this is where during the inspection, you guys negotiated repairs. Um, you go to make sure all the repairs have been done. And then after the final walkthrough, the closing happens usually the same day sometimes the next day and you, you you typically get possession on closing day of the property and then you get keys you get your keys 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 keys, keys. <laughs> <laughs> i love it thank you for that crystal oh that was a great diagram i can I, i'll figure out a way, i'll send it to sandra or i'll figure out a way to send the diagram just so you okay. guys can have access to it. I couldn't figure out how to paste it in the chat. Okay, no worries, we'll get it figured out. Um, I have a question from, and hopefully I'm saying this correctly, Jakira White. Uh, she wants to know, do you find your own attorney or does that come from the realtors agency? Who, who finds the attorney? You it's wherever you get the, the re referral. I mean, a lot of people give mm -hmm. the referral from a realtor if they if, if they don't have anyone in their network, any friends or family, they give them a referral. You get the referral from your realtor. Mm -hmm. And then Dominique Bailey wants to know, how does getting a pre-approval affect your credit report or score? Is it reported as an inquiry on your credit report? Hmm. Wait, what's the question? I give an honest answer to that. So, yeah. So, does getting a pre-approval pre affect your credit? Oh, yeah. There's a certain period of time. But, so, for instance, when you, uh, I'm going through the process right now. So, I got the inquiry, and then I saw the alert that came up that there was an inquiry on my credit report for a uh, home buying. Mm -hmm. And I got this two-week window where, in those two weeks, I can go to multiple lenders. They can all pull, and it won't affect my report during that period of time, during that two-week right. period of time. So I can go to as many lenders as I want during that. But if you have too many of them pulled in a period of time, then it will lower your score. So you want to do, you want to be serious. You can't be playing around. Like you got to be serious that I'm going to buy a home right now mm -hmm. or buy a multi or whatever it is you're trying to buy during that period of time. Gotcha. Thank you. So I'm wondering too, just to touch on, um, I think it was Jakira's question. So if you don't have anyone in your network, right? Like how do you even find a realtor? Cause I think that that's something I'm noticing is an issue too. And a realtor you can trust to also have a valid network that's people who are reliable. I mean, there's a realtor like right here or here, depending on what you're looking at. <laughs> right. you're, you're over here uh, right now. <laughs> But I, I would say if you weren't on, let's say we, we you weren't on this this chat right now, and you didn't see Crystal. Um, we're all on social media, so and, and we and we know people. So if you know someone who bought a home that's beautiful and they are happy with their home, then you can ask them who was your realtor who helped you find that property. Mm -hmm. um, or if you're just doing it exclusively through social media, you and you're looking at people who are successful who have bought properties or help people buy properties. Um, you know, the realtors on there and then you kind of vet them and, you know, and ask, uh, you know, about their previous clients is someone who just closed, whatever, because then you can go talk to people, previous clients and see how they felt about the experience. Crystal, what, what's your IG? My IG is Chris the Bliss. <laughs> That's K-R-Y-S-T-H-E-B-L-Y-S-S. -S -S. Okay. Um, Are you yeah. typing in the chat, Tia? Yeah, okay. okay. Sorry? Your social media can you repeat it. The, the, she's typing it in there for you. Oh yeah, here I can just do it so I don't have to spell it again. Um. <laughs> so yes, I would agree with what they said. I think it's important vetting out anyone that you're going to use. However, I am a realtor and I'm right here. But there mm -hmm. are. I would also say when you're looking at realtors, um, you should be able to Google them. If you cannot Google your realtor, I don't know. Like if, if maybe they're with a brokerage that doesn't 
automatically populate something to Google, but you should be able to figure out some of the past properties that they've had. Um, and just, I would suggest uh, speaking to past clients or talking to a few of them. Because from talking to them, you'll be able to gauge how much they truly know about real estate process because there's a lot of realtors. Yeah, and, and I'll also say you want a full-time realtor. Like you want someone who this is what they do for a living, not someone who does this on weekends every once in a while because mm -hmm. that experience matters and their commitment um, and time to actually locating a property, doing the comps, giving you all the numbers, the hardcore numbers that, so that you can make a, a, a good decision comes from a full-time realtor. And then also, if you're doing a 203K renovation as opposed to just buy, uh, buying a turnkey single-family home, you should get a realtor who has experience in that particular thing that you're trying to do. There are niches for each one of these uh, types of properties that you're looking for, and you want your realtor to be experienced in the thing that you're trying to do. And there's also niches in neighborhoods and like different community areas around Chicago because they're not mm -hmm. all the same. It, there's 77 community areas. So for someone to know something about every single one would be challenging. So right. Like, you get a, a realtor from the north side and they do almost all their work on the north side. Mm -hmm. They may not necessarily help you the same way with locating a property on the south side in Bronzeville. That's good advice. Um, and just really quickly, we launched the second poll. Are you actively looking for a home or a building currently? Uh, because the question about the pre-approval made me think of that. And of the people who responded, 61% have said, no, they're not actively looking right now. Um, so I'm just curious, you guys who are watching, if you can just type in the chat, um, what's stopping you from looking right now? Um, some, somebody's going to say the, the recession, you know, not, look here, the recession can be a good thing. There's, there's going to be somebody on the bad side and somebody like the, all of us who are going to be on the, on the right side of this recession. Yeah. And, 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 Let us know in the chat. I'm the the lowest that be, and that's how excited I am about this. Right. Interest rates are at the lowest that they have historically ever been if you are in position if you have a seven a, 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 a 650 or a 700 credits whatever it is and you have um you know seven eight thousand dollars in cash but you also have a 401k that has uh, uh, 15 twenty thousand in it or whatever you're in position right now take advantage of this before mm -hmm. things change before yeah. those interest rates go back up y'all can just go ahead and move over to the click yes side of this conversation <laughs> I, I see some good responses though. So, you know, city prices are sky are, are high. That's coming from Ama. Kimberly says she was worried about the down payment, which we, we did talk quite a bit about. Um, Dominique isn't actively looking at the moment, but wants to start preparing and will start looking soon. Um, currently in school and don't have enough saved. Uh, and maybe you want to touch on savings and budgeting a little bit. Um, before. Well, that starts right now, too. Okay. Don't wait till um, I have that good job or, you know, people are constantly waiting to meet these milestones when they can be incrementally putting $100 away every two weeks. You know, you could be doing something towards your goal right now or getting that second job and stop playing around with, oh, I'm just going to sit on the couch and watch Netflix for eight hours when, you know, you could be doing Uber Eats or whatever it is as a second job or whatever it is because me – there have been multiple times in my real estate journey where I was working seven days a week because I had a goal to get to. If we didn't just overnight have all the resources and all the money, we had to get here. Somebody in your network can give you a gift uh, towards a down payment. And, and I say this particularly from the perspective of getting a multi-unit building. You know, those rent, when those rents come in, you pay them back. There's somebody, family member, somebody you went to school with, you know, Y'all, you just make a deal with them. I give you ten percent. You know, on this five thousand that you about to give me. You know, so, the, look, there's, a, there's so many different circumstances that I think people look at one way of doing this, right? And they feel like if they can't do it the one way they've heard about, then they can't do it. Just like the whole, oh, it costs too much to buy a property in the city. But that just means that because you want to do a turnkey, you can't do it. Now you have to look at alternative ways to still buy your property below market value in the city during the renovation. Requires more work, more effort, 
but you can still get it. You can afford to do it. Or you sit there and wait. It's only going to get more expensive unless this recession thing happens. But I, I don't believe that it's going to hit the real estate market as hard as it hit in 2008. Uh, it won't it because won't. subprime won't. lending is not a part of the, the conversation right. this time around. Mm-hmm. We have a pandemic. We have a, an idiot for the president. I mean, that's it. <laughs> right. So, so those wanna... waiting for that 2008 market crash. That's not going to happen. Gonna happen. <laughs> So to that point, so maybe the market is good to buy now, but I want to get into this question from Essie because she brings up a good point. And and I'm going to read it how she wrote it. She said, "Uh, we don't got none of that credit score or retirement. So can we talk about trying to buy a home and buy a property when we already know that many of us as black people don't really have a lot of savings? We may not have retirement plans or they might not be substantially funded, credit score, looking crazy, uh, all these financial disadvantages that many of us are, are at. And we may not have families that have talked about finances and owning. So how do you get on the path of home ownership if you don't have these basic things? You don't have a savings, you don't have retirement. All right, well, I can give the very first example when I bought my first property. I want to go all the way back. So I'm going back to 2005, Mm -hmm. all right? I humbled myself, and I lived at home. Didn't pay rent. I don't know if 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 it – I know everyone isn't in a position to go live with somebody, but if you do have that option and you just turn your nose up at it because you don't want to live with your parents or grandma or whoever, but if you can, do that. Second, I worked two jobs and worked seven days a week, and I did that for 18 months, for a year and a half. I did that for a year and a half, and I wasn't kicking it as much, wasn't spending money, wasn't taking vacations, wasn't doing any of that stuff, because I had this goal, this single-minded, blinded goal towards saving the money and, and bringing my credit up by paying off all my bills. And so it's, it's just like, man, how, how bad do you want it? And this isn't a microwave thing. This isn't, you know, in 30 days, I'm going to have the money or 90 days, I'm going to have the money. This is like, are you dedicated for 12 months to turning your life around? I also want to touch on that because I'm in that same boat. Like, I didn't have none of that. Mine is the credit score. Like, my credit score is, for my age, for my circumstances, okay, my credit score is pretty impressive. But... Um, I think that's something we don't look at, which is very important to like black African people is networking across. So building together, share economics, right? Like that's an option we always have. You have another friend that's working class that wants to own. That's something that we don't consider. You don't have to wait until you're married to buy something with a person, right? Like you can, your your friend who both work minimum wage jobs can save enough money. You save up 5,000, she saves up 5,000 and together you two have 10,000. That's enough for a down payment. So I think that like, as they said, using those different networks and like using the resources that you have, if it's not going to be a family member, if you don't see yourself moving into a building or a house with your family, your like blood family, you have chosen family that you can move forward with. And that's, that's a very solid option. Very solid. Now, there's another alternative, and it's, it's called uh, REITs, like a, a real estate investment uh, uh, fund or trust. And like Chris Senegal, who's been on our podcast, has a real estate fund in Houston right now. And we bought 10 shares of, of his fund, which was $500. And it, it bought 18, like, I guess it's 18 uh, homes in the, that's currently in it. And we're going to get, um, you know, residuals back. Yeah, dividends. We're going to get dividends. And the dividends start uh, kicking back after 18 months. So Before I guess what, have- he's, what he's pointing to is making an investment that will give you a return 18 months later. Yeah. Combine that with working two jobs. Combine that with lowering your expenses. Combine that with not paying, you know, not living alone and paying $1,200 to live by yourself when you can – you know, get a roommate and then and maybe only pay five or six hundred dollars a month. I mean, or less. Um, yeah, I'm just saying real estate investment funds are, are, are is less work. Somebody else is doing all the work. It's, it's almost like buying stocks, you know, on the stock market. But it's, it's real estate and you're getting a small amount of money back quarterly, you know. Before we close out, I want to make sure we get to Benita's question. 
Can you share examples of lenders? Uh, you all mentioned multiple lenders and like the bank, are there, are there other types of lenders? There's different types of lenders depending on what you're looking for. So there's Chase Bank and Bank of America where if you bank with them, sometimes they're like, oh yeah, we'll give you a deal. However, as a realtor, depending on what you're buying, I typically tend to tell people to go towards mortgage banks who specialize solely in mortgages versus a bank mm -hmm. like Chase or Bank of America. There's usually less transparency. They take longer. There's a longer turnover between them talking to the loan processor, they're talking to the underwriter. It's just yes, not right. a direct a approach. Right. approach. Right. Yeah. There's guaranteed rate. Um, then you, have a, rate. You, have, you have smaller banks like GN Bank, which is right there on 46th and Cane Drive. It used to be Illinois Service Federal, which is a black owned bank. And, and uh, oftentimes those are easier or, or more relaxed, um, you know, rules to, to the funding. Well, we are almost at our limit. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes to go, but I want to give each of you an opportunity to share some final thoughts, words of encouragement, uh, possible next steps for people. So now that they have kind of a basic idea, what's the next step uh, and information on where they can find you. We'll go ladies first. <laughs> it's always you, Crystal. Okay, like it's always going to be first. Okay, well, I'm so thankful for y'all having me on this panel today to talk with you guys. Um, I want to reinforce and stress that I do think home ownership is important, whichever strategy or avenue you decide to go, whether it's a condo, a house, a building. Um, I would say that it is a dedication and it's not something where you're just going to wake up and be like, oh, I can do this now. Like you do need to work towards it. You do need to have discipline in your spending because especially as Chicago starts to open up, we're starting to get tempted, going out to eat, going, doing different mm -hmm. things where honestly during COVID probably had a good chance of saving a good amount of money. I know I mm -hmm. personally did not spend that much money during COVID. Um, but I do stress it. I think it's the only way to ensure that we're not displaced from our communities. And with certain things happening, like the Obama Center coming to Woodlawn and things like that, we're already seeing gentrification start to trickle into these neighborhoods. So it's important now to grab it while we still kind of have majority. Um, mm -hmm. You can reach me on Instagram. I already put it in the chat. You can also reach me by email, crystalcorley90 at gmail. You can Google my name. My cell phone number is on Google. <laughs> You're accessible. Why. <laughs> but I'll get another phone number. <laughs> so, but you can I have a 20 of y'all in the DMs tonight. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank um, you. Words of encouragement, you can do this. Mm. I mean, whoever's watching right now, you can do this. It may feel like it's daunting or it's, long, it's far away or it's a lot of money, but take it one day at a time because you can do this. Once upon a time, we didn't have any property. We didn't know any real estate professionals. We had never did a renovation. Once upon a time, we had nothing. And then, but, but an idea and our, our parents saying, go out and make it happen. And you can make it happen too. Um, if you want to reach us, you can reach us on Instagram at the Downing Brothers, T H E D O W N I N G B R O T H E R S, the Downing Brothers. Yeah, <laughs> and that's our website as well. Yeah, the Downing Brothers dot com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, Anthony, you mentioned a bank when we were talking about lenders. Can you repeat the name of that bank? Um, uh, guaranteed rate. Guaranteed rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do a lot of business with guaranteed rate. So yeah. We only we only speak on things that we've actually done ourselves. Right. Like we never refer people to anything that we yeah. haven't actually done. Ourselves. Like on, 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 on our first two apartment buildings, our first two three unit buildings, we worked with Illinois Service Federal, which is now GN Bank. Yeah. But I mean, that was years back. Now we work with Guarantee Rate. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Guarantee Rate. Right. I work with WinTrust a lot, also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And WinTrust. If you guys missed that, Guaranteed Rate WinTrust. Mm -hmm. Uh, for viewers, for everyone watching, before we wrap up, um, we will have this replay available at some point very soon. So if you would like to share this with a friend or if you just want to go back and refer to it, that will be available. Make sure you sign up for the Build Bronzeville email list, our newsletter. 
um, because we'll probably post uh, the link to the video in that newsletter. I will actually put a link here to make it easier for you. And it's super simple, billbronzeville.com backslash subscribe. Um, and we just appreciate you all yes. tuning in tonight. Tia, you have some final words? Uh, no, thank you all for coming. I, I mean, I learned a lot and I'm glad that I was here to be honest. So I hope that everyone else also benefited. Yes, email us anytime. Let us know what future topics you'd like mm -hmm. to have videos on related to home buying or even to financial literacy because that sounded like something that we also would like to visit in the future uh, yeah. to talk about budgeting and just doing all all those things that get us to the path of getting the keys 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 yeah. in our hands yeah. uh, so with that said thank you so much crystal corley thank you to the downing brothers anthony and anton thank you tia mm -hmm. for being such a great co-moderator uh, and thank you all for watching. We truly appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Uh, that's been Build Bronzeville. Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs>